Over the past few weeks, we've been studying the first five. And I don't know about you, but I've always loved the first five of the Old Testament. They're filled with history. They're filled with information about God's people. But what I've come to learn over this study is they're filled with portraits of God, of who God is, of what God wants, and who God wants. And as we study tonight, we're going to enter into the book of Numbers, and it's, a, it's always been one of my favorite books, because it's a book of faith. It's a book of trusting God. And if there's anything that we need in the day that we live, it's a, it's a good reminder to trust the Lord. The God who created this world certainly knows more than we do. The God who sustains this world certainly knows what we need. And the God who has created a home in eternity certainly knows where we need to go. And it's interesting in the book of Numbers to see how God cares for His people. Even though most people look at the book of Numbers as a book of punishment. But yet I want you to see tonight, God cares. Before we move any further in our lesson, there's something I do want to bring to your minds. I've kept this in my Bible right at the book of Numbers. I've mentioned it several times and doesn't mean much to you, but it, it does mean something to me. It's a, it's a handwritten sermon outline that I preached here some time ago, and I chose to keep it in the book of Numbers just because I thought that was very fitting for the sermon it was. It was a sermon entitled Big Dreams, if you remember that. I keep it in the book of Numbers, so every time I am in the Old Testament, this page always has to open up, and I always pick it out and look at it, and it's becoming a little worn now because I've looked at it so much. But I believe that's important, at least to me. So for tonight, I'm going to put it back in the book of Leviticus, and I'll put it back in Numbers when we end tonight. Go ahead and turn to Numbers, and we'll study this book. It's a, it's a book about faith. Here's what we're going to do in our study tonight of the book of Numbers. We'll, we'll take a look at the interesting facts, and because I love this book, there are more interesting facts in this particular lesson than normal. But don't worry, they're brief. We'll look at the key passage. I think there's one passage that stands out that should teach us this is a book about faith. Here's how we respond to God. Here's how we react to God. Then we'll look at a key event. There's one event, and it happens in two different chapters, that should be, and matter of fact, I'm going to pull this out again, that should remind us always to stand with the Lord. Then we're going to look at a thing entitled God Cares. Yes, there's punishment in the book of Numbers. Matter of fact, there's 40 years of it. But God cared for His people. And inside of that punishment, you're going to see the reason and the reality of God's care. And then finally, as we end, we'll look at the twos of Numbers. Since it is the book of Numbers, there are a lot of two things inside of this book that I find to be pertinent to us as we study and prepare to conclude our lesson. Let's start off tonight by talking about some interesting facts. The name, its meaning, is derived from the two numberings or the two censuses of the book of Israel, or of the people of Israel. There are two occasions in which the people are numbered, so thus the title of this book is very fitting. It has to do with numbers. Of course, the author is Moses, and the date of its writing is right around 1450 to about 1410 B.C., but it's interesting, this book at least, it's been called several different things. I, I, I call it the book of faith. But some authors have said it's the book of journeyings. And truly, it is a book of journeyings. It's a book that categorizes and shows us the people of God spending 40 years doing something that should have only taken them 11 days. Some have called it the book of murmurings. Over and over in this book, why have you brought us out here to die? Now tonight we're not going to look at those passages, but I think it's fit to notice that the people who were murmuring had forgotten what God had already done for them in their lifetimes. 
How much easier is it for us to forget when we're so far removed from the time of Christ? They were in the very lifetime of the very exodus of Egypt, and they forgot what God had done. And some will rightfully call this the fourth book of Moses. But as you think about this book, it covers about 39 years. It really covers a short period of time. It covers about 21 days in the first 10 chapters, about 38 years in the latter half of the book, or at least the next rest of the book, and then the final few verses into the last chapter and into Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 3, covers about six months. But in total, we're only talking about 39 years of Israel's history. But yet, I think it's 39 of the most important years for you and me. Because over and over, and I don't think I can understate this tonight, over and over these people are going to come to God, come to Moses and say, Why have you failed us, Lord? At least that's what they will do in their approach. It may be not what they say, but it's certainly what was meant by their statements. So 39 years of the people's history. As you think about this book, I want you to think about the time. I think this is important. 13 months. 13 months after the people left Egypt is the book of Numbers. So think about how far removed they are from the plagues. Think about how far they are removed from the Red Sea. Not that far, is it? In the reality of time, and you can say this in your life, I know I can say it in mine, 13 months isn't anything anymore, is it? Time just keeps getting faster and faster, doesn't it? They're only 13 months away from the time God delivered His people. And yet, what do they do? They murmur, they complain, and they resist the very Lord. Now, there is one main event that takes place in this book, and it is a tragic account of consequences on the behalf of Israel's, now listen to this, unbelief or lack of faith. God had told them exactly what they needed. God had showed them the way. Matter of fact, He's going to send out folks to bring a report and yet they don't believe the report that God sends back to them. The event of this book is unbelief. That's why I keep partially this lesson here at the book of Numbers. I know it doesn't mean anything to you, but it does to me. Do we really have things we believe in? Do we really believe that if we'll do what the Lord asks of us, He'll bless that work? That was Israel's problem. They heard as clear as day what God wanted for them, yet they could not see it when it was right in front of them. The book of Numbers, matter of fact, there's a lot of numbers take place in this particular book, but it's interesting to me that the tense of these people in Numbers chapter 1 and verse 26, talking about the numberings of people, the tense of these people would have covered square miles just thinking that there were about two and a half million people by the time they were finally numbered. You think about Israel. They weren't just a little nation. They were a large people. And yet, unfortunately, many would die because of their lack of faith. I think that's also one of the reasons it's called the book of Numbers. Not just because of the countings, but because of the tragedy. God, it says, here's the land. Possess it. Oh, we can't do that. And how many countless lives died because the people of God would not have faith. I find that interesting, don't you? Thousands died because of a lack of unbelief or a lack of belief inside of God. God's going to give these people a promise in Numbers chapter 13 or, or Numbers chapter 14 verse 34. And he's going to say after the number of days which ye searched the land even 40 days each day for a year shall you bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall not, or and ye shall know my breach of promise. It's time for them to wander. 
It's interesting that usually when God gives a promise, it's joyous. But God gives a promise here, and it's true. Now, what I find very impressive, if you'll humor me for just a moment, if you'll turn to the very last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 36. I'm sorry, let me correct myself here. I can get my Bible and my thumbs to work for me. Deuteronomy 34. I want you to notice verse 5 to help us see this promise because it's still in place all the way to Deuteronomy 34, verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab. Listen to this. According to the word of the Lord. Why? He had lost his faith. According to the word of the Lord. It's the very promise in Numbers 14, 34. They were not going to see this very city. It's interesting to me that God gave them what they needed. There's a reality in the book of Numbers. What could have been an 11-day journey turned into 40 years. Now, I find that to be just staggering, don't you? What they could have walked into and what they chose to walk around. I think there's some great application to the Lord's church in this particular scene. When we fail to do what the Lord requires of us, how long must we wonder? Now, I know there's no answer to that question. But when we fail to do what the Lord requires of us, how much should we wonder? How much will we wonder? In despair and turmoil till we recognize what God truly, really wanted us to be. The book of Numbers is impressive because we're going to study in a few moments what really took place of this reality. Why did this happen? Was there any hope? And you and I know this, there was hope. There were some who knew they could take the land because God was on their side. There were others who could only see the giants. How do you face the giants that are in your life? Do you recognize that there's nothing that cannot be possible when we're doing righteousness inside of the Lord? But yet how many times do the giants of our lives stop us? How many times does government stop us from doing things? There's a statement, and I'm not saying this because any of you have said it, but I'm, I'm tired of reading it in articles. I'm tired of hearing other folks say it, but there are giants that we face. Some individuals have said, but we'll lose our tax-free status. I have a response to that. Oh, well. There may come a day when we're told you teach that and you lose this. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we face bigger things than that. What are we going to do when others don't like what's being preached in this very pulpit? That's a giant we may have to face one day. Do we tone it back? Or do we stand in the footsteps of faith? What happened to Israel? They lost their faith. God said, go possess the land. What has our Lord told us to do? Go possess the land. Not literally in the way we're talking about in the book of Numbers, but figuratively and go throughout the whole world and teach all of my creation. That still applies. And how long must we wonder because we won't face our giants when it comes to the Lord's church? How many years will we go by afflicted? The key passage was read for us just a moment ago, and it is Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20, verse 12. And this passage, interestingly enough, is addressing Moses and Aaron. And it talks about faith. Numbers chapter 20, verse 2. There was no water for the congregation, the assembling of God's people. It's interesting to me that in the book of Numbers, over and over and over and over and over and a couple more times over, God's people needed something that they couldn't do for themselves. And God filled that need. Here they needed water. They were in a desert land. 
Where were they going to get water? The Lord provided. But verse 12, listen to this. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because you believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore shall ye not bring this congregation to the land which I have given them. Brings us back to Deuteronomy 34, doesn't it? According to the word of the Lord. All these things inside the book of Numbers are going to play out as true as the Lord states them. I think there's a side note to the book of Numbers. When God says it, He means it. I think that's a lesson we need to learn, don't you? And it's over and over in the book of Numbers. When God says it, He means it. And what happened in this particular scene, Moses and Aaron were told what to do, and they made their own plan. They substituted a few things around. They believed the Lord not. They lost their faith as well. So the key passage of this book has to do with Moses and Aaron in unbelief. Which brings us to the key event in this book of Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13 and Numbers chapter 14. It's interesting in Numbers chapter 13... The Lord speaks unto Moses, interestingly enough, about 88 times, I believe, is the number that particular phrase takes place in the book of Numbers. And the Lord spoke to Moses. That's a high number if you're counting. Verse 2, Send thou men that they may search the land of Cana, which I have given unto the children of Israel of every tribe of their fathers. Ye shall send a man, every one a ruler among them. And then, of course, verse 3, Moses, by the command of the Lord, does this thing. It's interesting, Moses, in verse 17, he sends them out to spy out the land of Cana and said unto them, Get ye up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, verse 18, what it is. And the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities that they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage and bring out of the fruit of the land. Now there was, now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. What, what, what's Moses do? Go see the land. Go inspect, bring back this report. Remember what God had promised, a land flowing with milk and honey. Go see this land and bring us back the good news. Well, you and I understand that the people are going to come back, the, the spies of which they get called, the 12 of them. And they're going to tell, they're going to tell, verse 27, We came unto the land, whether thou sent us, and surely it flowed with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea in the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Finally, somebody excited about what the Lord had said. I love the scenes of this because verse 27, it was a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 28, nevertheless, the conversation turns. It's no more favorable. And Caleb steals the people. But verse 31, but the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And listen to verse 32 carefully. Because here, here's what I want to tell you in the book of Numbers. Your words matter. These did. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land, though it be, or though which we have gone to search it, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Did those words matter? For 40 years they're going to matter. This was a critical turning point where Israel rejects what God had told them by refusing to go up and conquer the land. One man here is stealing the people. We can do these things. 
And unfortunately, in Numbers chapter 14, God recognizes the disaster. Numbers chapter 14, verse 1, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Why did they weep? They thought the land was bigger than God. They'd lost their faith. It's the key event of the book. There's a lot we should take from that book. A lot we should take from that event. There's nothing that the Lord's church cannot face. I'm convinced of that. There's nothing the Lord's church can't do inside the bounds of Scripture. I'm convinced of that. But how many times will we say we're too afraid? How many times will we lose faith? And how much wandering will it really cost us? I know that's a play on words there, but what will it cost us? to lose our faith. But what's impressive of all of this inside this book, even though this is the key event of the book, God's people rebels against Him. God's people turn against Him. God's people say, no, we can't do what you told us we could do. Did you happen to notice in Numbers chapter 13, verse 2, send the people to go view the land that I've already given them? Hmm. How did God view it? As if it were their land. But they rejected him. But inside of this book, God cares. God miraculously feeds them and sustains them in the desert. That's impressive to me. And inside of that, he sustains their clothing. Matter of fact, this suit I'm wearing, I had to send it to the dry cleaners, number one, to clean it. But number two, I sat down in a chair and caught my pocket in the chair rail and ripped them. Our clothing wears out over time, doesn't it? Moths eat. You ever had that happen to you? A moth eats your favorite shirt. Our clothes wear out. But God sustained. He preserved their clothing. God gave them manna. He provided for them everything that they needed. God gave them the meat of which they needed. And yet over and over about the manna and the meat, we loathe this light bread. God gives them everything that they needed. We've already discussed that God gives them water. And we've already noticed as we've looked at this that God has given them leaders. God truly cared about these people. Let's make that correlation to you and me. Has God not provided what we need? In this physical life, in the world that we live, the answer is yes. And in this spiritual life, the answer is yes. We're talking about a book that shows us that God cares when His people are in punishment for 40 years, and that's where He takes care of them. Think about that for a minute. They turn their backs on Him, and what does He do? He takes care of them. Now let me ask this pivotal question tonight. Is there any reason we shouldn't be in heaven? Is there any reason we shouldn't be in heaven? I'll tell you a reason we should be. God cares. Has God not given us His Word to lead us in the way? Has God not established the church to give us a home? Has God not sent His Son to pay the penalty? And has God not prepared a home for us to dwell in in eternity? Just as God took care of His people. He takes care of us. And all the things that have been mentioned so far, even to the point that He gives leaders, God has done for His people. Especially when thinking about the Lord's church. God truly cares. It's not just a book about statistics or numbers. It's a book about God. And God took care of His people all the way through. And finally tonight, the twos of numberings. One of the first sets of twos happens in Numbers chapter 1 and in chapter 26. It's those numberings. There were two occasions in which the number, the people were numbered or the census were taken. The second set of twos were the journeyings that took place inside of this book in Numbers chapter 10 through 14 and Numbers chapter 21 through 27. Two journeyings. God gives two sets of instructions, Numbers chapter 5 through chapter 9. 
and Numbers chapter 28 through chapter 36. But this last one, I think, is really important. It's worth the twos for this very point. There were two generations in the book of Numbers. There was the generation of the exodus from Egypt. And there was the generation that would enter Cana. It's interesting to me that all of those from Egypt didn't enter Cana. But yet it's this new generation of which inside of the, the chapters, chapter 15 all the way down to chapter 20, of which is going to be spent time in instruction of how to be responsible in front of the Lord. I find that to be impressive. The twos of numbers. There were two generations one generation that lost their faith. Another that were going to have to go up and face the very same battle the previous generation faced. I think that should tell us something, shouldn't it? The same battles we face, someone is going to face again. Go up into the land, the first generation that come out of Egypt. We can't go. The next generation after 40 years, go up in the land. And they went. What will we teach the next generation? I'm not telling you we have to wander for 40 years to teach the next generation something. But can't we teach the next generation that God truly has their best interest at heart? That they belong in the Lord's church? That heaven is worth it all? I think truly that's something we can too teach outside of the book of Numbers. I'm going to place it back from the book of Leviticus over to the beginning of the book of Numbers because that's important to me. What's important to you tonight? What's important to you tonight? Is heaven important to you tonight? I hope as you're sitting here, the answer is yes. Matter of fact, I know your answer is yes. But I know just as much as that answer is yes, the world has a hold on us. I know it. I feel it too. My family feels it too. Your family feels it too. You feel it too. The question is, will we possess the land of eternity or will we wander for all of eternity? Maybe you're here tonight and you're not a child of God and you need to become one. You can do that tonight. The waters of baptism are ready waiting on you, but that's only going to come from a knowledge of God's Word. Listen to God's Word, understand it, and obey it, and become a child of God. But maybe you're here tonight as I look across this room and see a group of Christians that have many been Christians longer than I have been alive. You going to heaven tonight? You going to enter that heavenly realm? It's up to you and me. I know just as much as you do that life pulls on us. It tries to pull us away. It tries to use our work to keep us away from our family and from the Lord's people. It tries to use our friendships inside of this world to get us to do things we never would do. This world tries to use the television to teach us bad morals. It tries to use everything it can to get us to walk away from God and to lose our faith. We can't be like Israel in the book of Numbers. God says heaven is yours if you'll take it. Where will you, Christian, be on the parting of that day of judgment? That's up to you. If you're here as a child of God tonight and you recognize you're lost in sin, don't let anyone stop you. Sometimes we're afraid of what people are going to think of us. Don't let yourself stop you. Sometimes we're afraid we just can't do it. Well, that just ain't true. Turn to the Lord, and He'll always be there for you. He was for Israel. Remember, God cares. He took care of them. He'll take care of us. Dennis has picked out an invitation song for us, and it's time to sing that song. Need to become a child of God tonight? Is your time. 
need to make your life right with the Lord, tonight's your time. Don't wait any longer. Let's stand and sing.